Today we're going to do something a little less philosophical and a little more practical than usual. So if you've been watching the channel, you know that a lot of my videos cover really the theory of how to make perfume. Though today I want to do something a bit more hands-on and actually physically showing you uh, the full process of coming up with an iteration. So the task is simple. I'm going to imagine that I'm coming up with a new perfume idea and I'm going to start with just my very first iteration of the formula and I'm going to show you all of the steps involved in that iteration. So within the iteration, I'm going to further break it down into four really simple steps, which are the four steps that I use every time I'm making an iteration of a formula. So the first step is coming up with the formula, coming up with the idea and actually writing that down so I've got something to make. The second step is going to get all of the dilutions that I need to go and make that formula. That's getting the raw materials. The third step is actually making the formula. So how do I weigh it out on a scale with some pipettes? And then finally, the final step is to evaluate that. How do I uh, smell it, think about it, and then work out what I'm gonna do in the next iteration, which as you can guess, is just that same process repeated again and again. If that sounds good to you, then stay tuned and watch the rest of the video. Okay, so the first stage is coming up with the idea. Now, I haven't done any preparation for this video because I wanted to really give you an insight of just how it is when I would actually be thinking of something in real life. So I don't have any particular preconceptions of what I'm gonna do. However, what I was thinking was in the last video or one of the last videos where we did a review of Perfume as World, I got a new raw material called Guayacol. And I thought it would be cool to actually experiment with this because I was quite excited about it when I found it and I haven't had a chance to test it out yet. So I'm thinking, hey, let's try a formula with Guayacol. Now, the first thing when I'm thinking of a formula is um, I don't actually want to make it too complex, especially for a first iteration. I probably don't want to try more than maybe like five things in that first iteration because otherwise it's just going to be way too complex. There's going to be too much going on and I'm not gonna be able to actually understand what raw materials are doing what things. Now that said, the more you know your raw materials, the more you can put in your first iteration. And conversely, the less you know your raw materials, I would actually recommend less. If you're really new to perfumery, I would recommend your first iteration for a formula. You just try literally two materials together, maybe three. But as you get more experience and you already kind of can start to imagine your formula before you make it, and that's something that only comes with a lot of practice when you've smelled your raw materials individually a lot of times, so you know how they behave, and also you've tried them out in different formulas, well then you can actually move on to more and more and more raw materials in your initial guess for the formula. So I think probably something around five-ish. I don't know exactly where we'll end up at, but that's probably my aim. So now I'm gonna take you into formula, which is where I write all my formulas and I'm gonna kind of do the planning process for this formula live with you. All right then, so I wanted to make a formula to test out Guayacol. So firstly, I'm gonna go and add that. Now, in order to fill this out a bit more like a perfume, something to act maybe like a scaffold or a framework, I think it would be nice maybe to add something like the Grosjean Accord. And I think that would be good because it's kind of a ready-built perfume structure that I already know how functions. So I did a whole video on the Grosjean Accord. I'll put a link in the description to that. And I'm simply gonna take that Accord and use that same formula essentially and put that in as a single raw material. And I'll do that because it will just help me kind of have a base to the perfume. So let's get the Grosjean Accord. So after that, the kind of choice, I guess, opens up. Now, I'm thinking that if we're using Guayacol, because I remember it smelled kind of like vanilla and slightly smoky, slightly um, raspberry kind of thing, maybe we could do something that kind of emphasizes some of those aspects. So I think it might be good to add some vanillin because I think that would harmonize well with the guayacol. So I'm gonna go and add some vanillin. And then as well as that, um, I, I don't know, what do we add next? Well, see, I think now at this point you can go in all the directions, but one thing that comes to mind is when I made that uh, Mexican vanilla accord a few videos back. So basically what I found out was if you add coumarin 
to vanillin, it makes this quite nice accord. So I guess, and I, I can imagine the coumarin would go well as well with the guayacol. So I feel like I could add in coumarin as well as another raw material. So I'm going to add in coumarin. And then now I've got this. I'm kind of thinking that I've got probably a lot of base notes in this formula already. Um, and it's probably going to be quite heavy. So it's it's going to have, I'm guessing, kind of a sweet, a slight sweet theme to it. And maybe a slight incense theme added by the guayacol. Um, so I'm thinking maybe add some kind of heart note or top note, that kind of thing. So another thing is uh, about this guayacol. I actually had someone message me and said that they recommend eugenol go with the guayacol, which is something that normally smells a bit like cloves. So I thought maybe I could try adding that in as well. Um, so I'll add in some eugenol. And then since I've got now essentially a sweet and spicy kind of formula, I feel like something like a rose would naturally go quite well with this. So I've got this rose base, which I use all the time, which is called Rose Jivco 217. Though recently I got a different rose base um, called Rose Essence something, and I haven't used it yet. So I actually think it might be a cool opportunity to go and experiment with that. So if I go on um, to add that, it is here. So I can add some of that rose essence. And then, so we've already got six things, which is quite a lot. I mean, already, I think it's getting quite complicated, but I also do want to add in a top note still. And I want to keep with this kind of theme, this kind of, um, I don't know, it's kind of a pink theme, you could say almost. Now we've got the rose and the guayacol, it had that um, maybe raspberry cherry aspect. So I think something along those lines could work quite well. Um, now one top note that I have that I think would fit is anisyl acetate. So I think I will add that one as well. Oop. Oh, I had the wrong thing. I had an anise aldehyde. Though I think anise aldehyde would work quite well too. But for now, I want to try the anise elastate. But I think, yeah. Okay, so now we've got a palette, per se, of raw materials. I actually want to work out what kind of proportions I want to put them in, in the formula. Now, when I was making formula, one feature that I really, really thought was important was the ability for raw materials to see how you're using them in your formulas to help you use them in the future. So if we go on the Groschman Accord, we can already use this information to help out, essentially. So if we scroll down to the bottom, you can see all the places I've used the Groschman Accord in other formulas, how much I've used it at. So there are a couple of the bottom at 0%, which we can ignore, but everything else where I've actually put it in the formula, um, we can see that I've tried it around 1%, 5%, and around 9%. And I made this note, which is why it's highlighted in blue, that in this formula where I tried it at 1.5%, I actually thought the Groschman Accord was too weak. So that suggests to me it would be good to try the Groschman Accord at something like 5 to 9% in the formula. So I'm going to go back to my formula and I'm going to put the Groschman Accord. I'm going to aim to have this at about 5%. So now at the moment we are we have everything in 100% dilution and because all of my things are pre-diluted down to 10% or less or 1% for example I firstly want to change all the dilutions to 10% so I'm quickly going to do that which is hold it dilutions and scaling change it to 10% so I'll change everything to 10% so everything's at 10% now I'm going to add in some perfumes alcohol. And the reason I'm doing that is because I'm going to start this formula by saying I want that Grosjean Accord to be 5% because that's going to be the core of the formula. And maybe we're going to aim for like one gram or something. So let's just say, I don't know, 0.5 grams of Grosjean Accord. And if I add in 0.5 grams of perfumes alcohol, then that's going to put the Grosjean Accord at 5%. And what I'm going to do now from here is work out how much of everything else I want to add in. So by increasing the grams and when I put in a gram 
of something else, I remove that gram from the amount of perfume as alcohol. And by doing that, the Grosjean Accord will stay at 5% and I can end up building the rest of the formula around it. So hopefully it will become clear in practice when I start actually doing it. So, the Grosjean Accord is at 5%. Now, let's think next. So next, the vanillin, because I already know that often vanillin, I use it around 0.2%, I think. So... If we were to try a very small amount of vanillin, 0.05, let's say, that might be around the right level. And I want to push the vanilla on this. So for now, I could put it down to 0 0.033 grams. Oops, I clicked on something. Let's put it down to 0 0.033 grams. And as long as I take 0 0.033 grams off of the perfume as alcohol, then I'll remain at that constant target of one gram. So uh, 0.5 minus 0.33 is 0.446 something. 0.467, I think. Yeah. So you can see what I've done, that what I've done here is, and the reason actually first that I've added 0.0 Three, three grams of vanillin is that usually when I dilute things down to 10%, usually one drop is about 0 0.016 grams. So I can't really weigh out anything less than a whole number um, multiplier of 0 0.16. So in this case, 0 0.033 grams will be around two drops, which I can measure out pretty reliably. So now that I've added 0 0.033 grams of that, I want to take that off of the perfume as alcohol, or you can see that I've done because that maintains my whole formula at one gram, and that allows me to keep the Grosjean Accord at 5%, and it allows me now to have this vanillin at 0.33%. And you can see that if we repeat this process by shifting the mass of perfume as alcohol into something else, then we keep the percentages that we have. And in my personal opinion, in perfumery, the easiest way to work, or the best way to work, I think, just for me, is like, if you maintain your absolute percentages, so that's the percentage display, displayed here, so not the relative percentage, which is this one. So if you're considering, for example, just the Grosjean Accord and the Vanillin, and you ignore the alcohol, then you can see that that Vanillin is like 6%, and the Grosjean Accord is like 94%. But I'm not interested in that right now. I'm interested in the absolute percent, which is the actual concentration of that thing in the total mixture, including all the alcohol. And the reason that I like to use that is because that is similar to when you actually smell the dilution. So if you made a dilution of the Grosjean Accord at 5%, that should behave in exactly the same way now as it's behaving in this perfume. So now I've done the vanillin. I next want to do the coumarin, and because that was this Mexican vanilla accord, I firstly want to go and actually check that accord so I can remember. So I want to remember essentially the ratio that I found. So I found less coumarin than vanilla, so that's fine. If we go back to this formula that we're making, um, so if we've got we can't weigh out any less than 0.015 of coumarin. So if I want to keep that proportion, I'll essentially have to actually shift the coumarin down to 1%. So I'll change that from 10% down to 1%. And then I'll add in some kind of amount, let's say 0.1 grams for now. And again, we want to take that off of the perfume as alcohol, so it's now going to be 0.367. So, now what we've done here, essentially, is we've added that coumarin in roughly that 1 to 3 ratio to the vanillin. So you can see that 0.33% of vanillin is just over 3 times that 0.10% of coumarin, and that's the same ratio as my Mexican vanilla record. So that's why I've done it like this. Of course, it's the first iteration. 
later on if we feel, oh, it needs more Coumarin, then we can go and do that. So this is an example of how I change down the dilution when I want to weigh out less of something than I can actually physically weigh out. So by lowering the dilution, I can add more grams of it to reach the same percent, essentially. Okay, so these are the easy bits because I know roughly how to do them. The other things, I'm not quite so sure how to dose them. So I'm going to guess that with the rose essence, because rose bases are quite strong in general, and this one seemed quite strong as well, um, you probably don't need a lot of it. Same with the eugenol, probably same with the guaiacol, and the anise elastate, I think we can use a little bit more because it's not quite so strong. So if we do, let me think. What I'm thinking then is because we've got essentially these three things and this one, it might make the most sense if we were to do 0.1 grams of each of the three that I know are strong at a 1% dilution, and then we use the rest of that weight of perfume as alcohol, just for easiness's sake, to give to the anise elastate at 10%, and we'll see essentially what that makes. So you can see now I'm just kind of thinking of the formula a little bit in terms of how I'm going to make it as well as the actual things that are going in it. But the main principle here is if I know that rose essence, guaiacol and eugenol are all quite strong, then let's try using less of them. So to show you in practice, I'm going to say, okay, rose essence, let's change that down to 1%, right? So I haven't got a 1% dilution, so I'm going to have to actually go and add that, which means I'm going to have to go and make it as well. So rose essence, um, let's change that down to 1%. Guaiacol, again, I don't think I have the dilution. I don't, so let's go to guaiacol and add a 1% dilution. Let's change it down to 1%. And then finally the eugenol. I should have a 1% dilution. Yeah, let's change that to 1%. And then we'll leave the anastasic. And then we'll go to this rose essence and add 0.1 grams here into the guaiacol, 0.1 grams here, into the eugenol, 0.1 grams here, and to the anise elastate, we'll add 0 0.67, 0.067. And then we can delete this perfume as alcohol entry because we don't need it anymore. And as you can see, so I've done some of this maths in my head, but essentially I've worked it out such that we maintain this one gram of formula. And what I've also done here is I've made sure that the rose essence, the guaiacol, and the eugenol are also at this low, low percent of 0.1% in the final formula. So again, this is quite useful because if you have a dilution that you've made of 0.1%, then you can already get an idea for exactly how strong these raw materials should be before you've even made the perfume. And then because I know that anisolastate is a bit stronger, I've used a higher percentage. So even though there's less weight of it because I'm using a higher dilution, you can see that in the percent, which is the actual only thing that matters at the end, it's more. And then we've done this whole thing at about 6.4%. So this is really, really weak for a perfume. If we made this and we decided, oh, it smells really good as it is, we could try um, rewriting this formula in terms of higher dilutions in order to bring up that 6.4% to something a bit higher. We could essentially go and scale it. Another option is to use this as the basis of our formula and then keep adding new things, but start adding them on top of what we've already got in terms of the percent. So that 6.4 can slowly creep up over time as we add things. Essentially, you can do it whatever way you want. So now I've got my trial formula all worked out. I actually need to go and do the next step, which is to find my dilutions. Okay, so here are some of my pre-dilutions that I've made. Now I've alphabetically ordered these, so it's a bit easier to find. So firstly, we wanna find that anisyl acetate. So we're gonna start in the top left, and it is actually this one. So I've got that at 10%, we need that. Put that up here. Then we've got the coumarin next at 1%, which I think you can see. That's one we need. Then we have guaiacol at 10%. So this one I don't actually have yet at 1%, so I'm gonna to need to make this dilution up and I'll use the 10% dilution to make that. So I'll put that up here. Next, we've got the same story for that rose base, the rose essence. So this one, 
should be somewhere over here. Yeah, there we go, Rose Essence. So we're going to take that. And then finally we've got some Vanillin over here. And that's these five. The rest of them I actually don't have in this section. I've got them in a box somewhere else. So I'm going to quickly go and grab those. And then we'll get into actually making the missing dilutions for the Rose Essence and for the Guayacol. Okay, so I've gone and found the Eugenol at 1% and the Grosjean Accord at 10%, which were the two things we were missing in the formula. So next, what I'm going to go and do is create the 1% dilution of the Guayacol and the Rose Essence, which we were missing before. What I've done is I've got these labels, which I've already made beforehand, and I'm simply going to go and put those on the new bottle as the first step. So I'm now using these Winchester bottles, and I really like those because I could actually get these caps for them, which are polycone caps, which are good at keeping your raw materials safely locked away inside the bottle. Um, some of the caps you use, some of the vapors can actually get through them and start dissolving into the plastic. And it also helps keep your environment or your workspace quite scent free by keeping a really good seal between the raw materials and the outside environment. The downside of these Winchester bottles is that they are a little bit expensive compared to other options. So it's completely up to you, of course, which bottles you buy. Um, but I just I thought I'd let you know this is something I'm moving towards these days. So what I'll do is I'll take the bottle, get the label and simply put it on. Nothing too surprising here. And then the next step is I actually want to go and make my dilution. Oh, the other thing is nowadays I've actually got these these little stickers which I put on top of the bottle. So I have got the rose essence one here, which I put on. So I tighten them all the way up and kind of align it with the front label. And the reason for doing this is mostly because when I've got all of my raw materials in that rack where I was looking for them earlier, it just means that I can find them a lot quicker because obviously when you're looking top down at a rack full of raw materials, you can't see the label on the side. So in order to quickly find the one you're looking for, it's good if you can have, I think the first letter of its name is the most important thing, but also it's useful to have the full name and the percent as well because then it allows you to quickly find the right dilution of the right raw material. Okay, now in order to go and work out my dilution, I'm actually gonna go and use the dilution calculator in formula. So let's start with the rose essence. So this new 1% dilution that I'm making, um, I wanna say that I've made it today, which is January 29th, so I'm just gonna use that date. And I wanna make five grams of it. So I wanna make five grams of the 1% dilution. I'm starting with 10% dilution. So just calculate on that. And I need to add 0.5 grams of the rose essence at 10% to 4.5 grams of the perfumer's alcohol. So, okay, let's leave that there. I usually take my perfumer's alcohol and I just put it into a beaker with a pipette and I reuse this pipette for perfumer's alcohol. And the reason is because I'm only using it for perfumer's alcohol, it's not getting contaminated with anything else. And I usually wouldn't keep the iPad so close to the liquids, but I'm just showing you guys for the demonstration. So I put on the scale, I take my bottle with the 1% dilution that I'm gonna make, and I tear the bottle, or I tear the weight. So what this does is set the scale to zero on the weight of the bottle. Then what I'm gonna do quite simply is I'm gonna weigh 0.5 grams out of this. So that is the rose essence with a fresh pipette. So what I like to do is lift up the bottle for the first few drops, and that's because the scale doesn't always register the weight unless you do that, because it thinks it's like a gust of wind that it needs to correct. But after you've added the first few drops, you can start weighing it out as you'd expect. 
and we're going to go up until we get to 0.5 grams. And that one is 0.93, so it's about a half drop more than it wants. Okay, so 0.9896, that's close enough, that's fine. So I'm going to now put this pipette in the waste pipette, so these are all the pipettes I've used, and I don't reuse the pipettes that I've already used, in order to essentially stop the contamination of the pipettes. To be fair, I could have used that pipette again for just weighing out the rose essence in this exercise. But yeah, anyway, so now I've got this, I need to add another 4.5 grams. So I can either keep going up to five grams or I can just add that 4.5 grams that it said in formula. So let's start. And this time I know that it's gonna be quite a few pipettefuls. So I can add a whole pipetteful to begin with. And these are one mil pipettes, so each pipette should be just over one milliliter if I do the full thing. And then now we're getting closer to 4.5, I'm gonna to start to slow down. Okay, and there we go. We've got 4.5 grams exactly, which is great. And then I'm gonna keep this perfume as alcohol here for later. But now we have got a rose essence diluted down to 1%. Give it a shake. And we will use that for the formula. So next I'm gonna go to guayacol and I'm gonna repeat. And for the guayacol one, I'm gonna go and do exactly the same thing. I'm not gonna show you this one because it's exactly the same process as I did for the rose essence. So if you wanna know how to do it for the guayacol, you can just follow that last step for the rose essence and pretend that it's guayacol. Right, so now we've gone and made the pre-dilutions. We actually wanna go and make the formula itself. So firstly, the most important thing to do is to label the bottle. So I think we called this perfume Untitled 3 because that's what it was called. So I'm just gonna label it at that. But of course, if I was doing this a bit more seriously, I would have thought up a name for it in advance. So I'm gonna take that label and put it on the bottle we're gonna use. And this is the bottle we're gonna use to weigh out our formula. Now, the next step is to do the raw materials. So. In formula, we've already got our formula written out for us, and at the moment it's arranged in alphabetical order, which I think is fine. So I'm gonna arrange these raw materials in alphabetical order as well, so they're in order when we go to make the formula. So we've got anisyl acetate first, 10%, coumarin, 1%, eugenol at 1%, guayacol at 1%, rose essence at 1%, and then we've got the garage monocord at 10%, and finally vanillin at 10%. So now we can go and actually start weighing out the formula. So I'm gonna take the anisyl acetate. Now I know from experience that something pre-diluted in alcohol at 10%, 0.67 grams should be about four drops. So let's put that to the test. Let's weigh out three drops here to begin with and see what it weighs as. See, it weighs as 0.48. If I add one more drop, it weighs to 0.67 exactly. So this is another power of the pre-dilutions. It actually does allow you to use drops, not as your primary uh, way of writing your formulas, but it essentially makes your raw materials weigh something a lot more consistent, which allows you to conveniently use drop amounts when writing the formulas. So I knew in advance that 0.67 would be about four drops, which is why I know I can weigh that amount in my formula. So now now I've used this pipette. Um, if I was gonna go and iterate upon this formula, say tomorrow or later on today, um, one thing that I like to do is actually take a scent strip holder and hold the pipette like this in a crocodile clip and leave it behind the raw material. And the reason for that is 
as long as you keep these two together, you know that that pipette has only been used for that material. So if you use it again for that material, that should be okay. Obviously, this isn't really a great long-term solution, uh, but in the short term, I think it's good, and it's a good way to save on plastic, save on pipettes. So we've done the anisyl acetate. Now let's go for the coumarin, which is 0.1 grams. And again, I know that's probably going to be six drops. So let's go and put that in. One, two, three, four, five. Let's check it. Okay, I didn't tear the scale, but that's no big deal. So we've gone over by the tiniest amount, but that's the most accurate we would have been able to weigh, so it's fine. So I'm going to go and tar that again like I should have last time. Next we're going to take the eugenol. Again, it's probably going to be six drops. Let's do five. And yet yeah, one more drop. And that's as close as we're going to get. Next for the guaiacol. So I put in four drops and that's 0.67 grams. Two more and that should be about 0.1. Next for the rose essence. So we've done four drops and then we'll do two more. Again, it's pretty close to 0.1 grams. We're not gonna get any closer than that. And this is also the thing about having an accurate scale not only a scale to three decimal places, but also a proper scientific scale that's been designed with precision in mind. So this scale was really expensive, but I have to say it was worth every penny of it. If you don't have a scale this accurate, uh, you won't be able to weigh to the same degree of accuracy. And in that case, you're gonna have to use bigger trial sizes. So some people may comment on the fact that my sizes, my trials are tiny. The reason I can do that is because I invested so much in the scale to begin with. If you have a less accurate scale, you should probably do about 10 times larger than what I'm doing on my trials to make sure that you've still got the accuracy in weighing. Because if you don't have accuracy when you weigh, then essentially uh, your formulas, well, you're not really going to have made what you think you've made, which is a really big issue in terms of reproducibility. So we've got the Grosjean Accord next, which is 0.5 grams. So this one we're going to need a bit more. I'm going to move the iPad away just because this tall bottle I'm a bit more skeptical about. Okay, so. So we've got about 0.5 grams there. And then finally with the vanillin, got 0.33, so that's just two drops, it should be. So we can try that, two drops, and check it. Yep, that's about, it's very close, 0.37, 0.33. Again, it's as close as we're going to get. So yeah, I really am pushing the limit here for how small can you make your trial size. Um, it's something I like to do because it really saves the raw material cost, but again, I would only recommend doing this if you're very careful with weighing out your drops and you use a high accuracy scale. So, here we go. At the end, I'm just gonna shake it, and we are done. We've made the formula. So in the next section, I'm gonna go and do the evaluations. I'm not actually going to go and do that right now, and the reason is now I've just gone and made this formula. All of the vapors from all of these bottles that I've opened and all that vapor that's been on those pipettes, there is kind of a 
a cloud essentially of the smells that I've been mixing. And now because of that, my nose is no longer as sensitive to those smells. Um, it's called olfactory fatigue. So that's when your nose gets used to things and you can't smell them properly anymore or the smell becomes distorted. So if I were to evaluate this right now, I wouldn't have a true perception of what it actually smells like. What I need to do is air out the room, maybe open some windows, leave for half an hour, an hour, something like that, and then come back later and make the evaluation when I've got a fresh nose. One strategy I like to do is if you actually go and make your trial blends for the day in the evening, and then you just leave it overnight and then you come and evaluate them in the morning. And by doing a daily cycle like that, you end up doing just a little bit of perfumery each day and that adds up over time and then your trials add up over the days and you eventually get somewhere where you wanna be. Now, when I go and make these evaluations, what I'm gonna do again is on formula, I'm gonna go in here and in the formula notes section, I'm gonna go and start making notes about this formula. Um, but I will talk to you guys about that on the other camera. So I'm gonna come back in something like an hour and I'll let you know what I thought about the formula. Cool, so I finally made that formula. Um, I've come back, it's about an hour later, so I've got a fresh nose. And now we can finally go in and make the evaluation and see what it smells like. So I'm gonna take a scent strip, label it. And then I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna dip it in. And I'm gonna find one of the scent strip holders. And I'm just gonna leave this here. So first thing I'm gonna do is notice, can I smell anything that's diffusive? And interestingly, I already feel like I notice a kind of slight coumarin element, which is quite interesting because I thought that was so weak. But now let's actually go now and smell like the full thing and see what it's like. Okay, so that's pretty interesting. Um, so it's not too strong, um, but it's, it's actually kind of nice. And for sure I can smell the smoky effect of the guayacol, which is really surprising because it's quite weak. I was actually wondering if I would, if I would actually smell the guayacol, and for sure I would say that's one of the dominant features. So obviously like the Grosjean Accord is quite strong. And I can smell a kind of, I guess, pinkness from what I imagine is the rose and the anise elastate, but I actually do think it's maybe a little bit too weak. And there's something about this which is maybe a little bit soapy as well. And I'm not 100% sure what could be causing that. It could be that rose base that I'm using. But overall, I think I think the formula is decent. It's definitely not something that would be great as a final perfume, but it's an interesting like exploration as a first trial. And the other thing is I'll need to come back to this. So maybe after a day, tomorrow, after a few days and see what it's like, because especially given that there are a lot of base notes in here, things like the vanillin and the coumarin and the Grosjean Accord, obviously I'm not really gonna have a good idea of how these things are functioning properly until after a day or so, that kind of time period. But I do think, yeah, the, the there's quite a clean smellingness to the perfume. It's quite, it's actually fairly decently balanced, honestly. I think the levels we chose for the trials were pretty decent. And I actually think maybe even that guaycol is still a little bit too strong. It would have been nice if the vanilla element had come out a bit more. And again, I think um, a bit more fruitiness maybe from the anisolacetate state would have been good. So if I was gonna now go and take this formula and I wanted to continue developing it, um, given that there's already quite a lot going on here, one thing I could do is actually start taking ingredients out to work out what the effects of each individual ingredient is on this formula. If I wanted to go and build upon it from this, I think I would actually maybe try adding a little bit more anisole acetate, maybe then try an iteration without the rose base so I can gauge the effect that's having because I think that's the biggest unknown I'm having about this formula. What is that rose essence really doing? 
and then maybe another one with a much greater amount of the rosescence. So I can really have the full spectrum of what happens if you overdose that versus if you remove it, because I think that's the one thing that I'm looking at and I'm not really sure about how it's functioning in the formula. Overall though, the formula's not bad. I think there's a little bit of a cherry aspect to it, which is mostly the anisalacetate, um, I guess with the vanillin, which is nice. And yeah, it smells a bit like a heliotropin kind of thing as well. And yeah, I actually think it's it's fairly reasonable. Um, but really, yeah, the idea of this is not to be a finished perfume. I literally just wanted to show you guys what my thought process would be. And especially because sometimes when I make videos, I make a video where I do these trials and iterations, and it might seem a bit intimidating because, you know, I do all of these certain steps and you might be wondering, you know, how did he decide to do this or that next? Um, and how come these steps are all kind of working out. Um, I actually find most of the time in perfumery, most of your trials are more failures than they are successes. And for example, this trial, while there are some elements inside it which are good, overall, I don't think it's something that's fantastic. But the only way you can know is by making that blend and then having a think about it and thinking, ah, maybe this is too strong, this is too weak, I should cut this out or I could try adding something else. And then over the days, so if I was going to iterate on this, I would then go and try those new trials that I'd come up with. I would rewrite those as formulas and repeat exactly the same steps in this video. So write those formulas down, then go find those dilutions, make them up if I haven't already, go weigh them out, wait an hour or so, wait overnight, and go and evaluate them again. And it's literally repeating that cycle. And that cycle, essentially, after a lot of iterations, it might take 10 iterations, it might take 50 it's only after doing that that you'll finally come up with a perfume that you're really happy with. And I think a lot of people get frustrated at the fact that they'll go and throw a load of stuff together and it doesn't smell amazing. I mean, this is essentially what I've gone and done now, thrown a load of stuff together and it doesn't smell fantastic. I do think it's got good parts of it, but it's only by repeating all of those steps that you'll get an idea and actually build something up over time. It's not like you throw stuff together on one iteration and it comes out how you want. You put together an iteration and you learn from it and then that allows you to do your next iteration. Hopefully you refine it over time. So yeah, that's really all I wanted to cover in this video. And yeah, thank you very much for watching. So quick update, if you're a formula user, this week I've just added a feature where you can finally import a raw materials library from a CSV file. So this is something that's been requested for a while from a few people. So if you're one of those people, then definitely go and check that out. At the moment, it's only on the Mac OS version. So if you've got Mac OS, you can download the update for formula, and then you should be able to press this new button, which is at the top of the raw materials library, and that will allow you to upload a CSV, and it will take each row, which is a raw material, and it will basically turn those in to actual raw materials in formula. So there's a few columns, which are things like the name, the cast number, all the fields essentially you can add in formula. And if you've already got a CSV of your raw materials, then feel free to go and take your CSV, shift around the columns so it fits the right format that's required for this import CSV, and then go and use that if it will help you out. I'll put instructions for that on the formula website in the description below. So if you're interested in that, definitely go check it out. And that's it for this video. So I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, if you've got any suggestions for future videos, do let me know in the comments. And until then, have a great week and see you next time.